Hello everyone, I'm back. This is Mel, formerly of Sneakers Corner, and I have just started a new channel. As you can see, it's, it's on the Rumble website, and it is simply called Origins, and the idea is that we are looking at the origins of Islam on this channel. Um, I am one of the people who are part of a group called the Sen Sifters, which was coined by Jay Smith. And uh, we are a group of people who have um, been exploring the origins of Islam over the past few years. And uh, we are making um, videos about that work and uh, sharing it with our audience and hopefully trying to solve the mystery of how Islam really began, working together uh, collaboratively and sharing um, evidence that we can find from different locations, including academic papers and so forth. So let's get ready to rumble on this channel, which I've called Origins. And please remember to subscribe and bookmark this channel so that you can find it again. And if you like what I'm doing, don't be afraid to hit the like button and to share this video with others. I'm going to be focusing over the next few videos on AJ Juice's paper, The Jewish Serpent King in the Dome of the Rock. Primary evidence, Big Daddy of inscriptions, a colossal fraud. Were the Dome of the Rock and its inscriptions made by Abdul al Malik in the late 7th century? Or were they the product of a later time? Up to now, we have assumed that we had bona fide evidence that both were created in the 7th century, but A.J. Juice's paper calls this fundamental assumption into question. A great deal of Islam's veracity hinges on this primary evidence. If these turn out to be fabrications, then where does that leave the Sen? It is believed that Muslim historians deliberately downplayed the extraordinary building over the foundation stone because Abbasids intended to belittle Umayyad achievements. However, a non-existent monument needs no downplaying. That the original buildings were still Jewish, despite possible shallow efforts to pretend otherwise, however, would become a Muslim embarrassment the moment that proto-Islam would emancipate itself from Judaism, its mother religion. Um, A.J. Juice quotes from Zophronius, who was the patriarch in Jerusalem at the time. He says, The God of Saracens entered the holy city of Christ our Lord, Jerusalem, with the permission of God and in punishment for our negligence, which is considerable, and immediately proceeded in haste to the place which is called the capital. They took with them men, some by force, others by their own will, in order to clean that place, the dunghill, the temple mount, and to build that cursed thing, intended for their prayer, and which they call a mosque. Now, obviously, the part which is in the square brackets is A.J. Juice's note, um, and he's connected with another part of his paper, with a reference to the Temple Mount as a dunghill. A.J. Juice cautions us not to assume this was over the foundation stone. He says, We do know that Alid Umar's place on the Temple Mount was replaced with Muawiyah. If anything, it most likely refers to this change of ownership, but there is no primary evidence that puts a building over the foundation stone. So, the important thing is, don't assume that whatever building was being done, it was done over the foundation stone. At least, not yet, at this stage. Where was the building referenced by Arculf? From Adamnan Arculf's text, it can be inferred that the dome was neither standing nor under construction during the 670s. Well, obviously, there's nothing controversial there. He goes on to say the original prayer house in Jerusalem that had been built in the 630s was enlarged and used by the Saracens on top of Roman ruins. And so he goes on to quote Arculf, who says, 
in that famous place where once stood the magnificently constructed temple near the eastern wall. The Saracens now frequent a rectangular house of prayer which they have built in a crude manner, constructing it from raised planks and large beams over some remains of ruins. This house can, as it is said, accommodate at least 3,000 people. So here is an image taken from his paper. You can see the white line and the red line. The white line is coming from the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The red line is coming from where he believes the um, building that our cult is referencing. Okay, so let's hear what he has to say about that. Our cult's text makes no hint at the construction or existence of the dome. Originally, the Al-Aqsa Mosque must have been oriented towards the foundation stone, white line, right image. The only problem is that it was not there. Now, in elsewhere in the paper, he actually referenced the Al-Aqsa Mosque as being in the southeastern part. Okay, down here first, before it was later built afresh here. Uh, I believe it was in the 11th century, he says. Okay, so, but even putting that aside, it's interesting that when it was built, it was oriented towards the Sacra, even at that late time. Again, just emphasizing how important that foundation stone was to Muslims in the 11th century. Now, it would have been, referring to this building here, it would have been placed at the centre line of a 90 degree angle to the eastern wall, red line, right image, which is in the left image here, in, in my case. To accommodate 3,000 worshippers, the house of prayer would have had to be at least 24,000 square feet, or 2,200 metres squared. Earlier in the paper, Juice refers to Saf and Marwa as two separate monuments on the Temple Mount. He says, Our Kulf mentions the Sufyanid structure of Surah 2 that was standing in the eastern part of the Temple Mount with ample space for the circumambulation, right rectangle. Were the Sufyanids indeed trying to distance themselves by a mere few feet from Jewish arc rituals as tradition suggests? Unfortunately, our Kulf is silent about the beliefs that were attached to the prayer house. Well, the fact that it was over in the east there, east of the Temple Mount, kind of outside the Jewish area of the Temple Mount is significant, and that might explain why Surah 2 talks about there's no nothing wrong in circumambulating these other monuments, the Safa and Marwa ones, which are presumably outside the core part of the uh, Temple Mount. He goes on to say, since the Marwanids were yet to rule, their monument was yet to be built. That's why Arkulf makes no mention of it at that stage. It was to be built shortly afterwards. Okay. Anastasius Seneta says nothing about the Dome of the Rock. He attests to a large-scale construction activities on the Temple Mount under Al-Malik. Around 690, he viewed the Saracen Arabs in the context of Christian heretics as Melchites, who he described as viewing Jesus as man, venerating other saints and rejecting the idea of a begotten son of God. It appears that Seneta describes the Umayyad strand of Proto-Islam in the Doctrina Jacobi. Several milestones between Damascus and Jerusalem, as well as temple iconography on pre-reform coins, indicate that the Holy City and the Temple Mount were indeed part of large-scale infrastructure projects, but nothing is said about the Dome of the Rock. This is followed by the Qur'an's mentioning of the Sufyanid and Marwanid monuments that can be circumambulated. So I think the key thing that he says there is that Anastasius does not mention anything about the Dome of the Rock at that stage, which is surprising. Now, Deuce goes on to say that the Dome of the Rock went through multiple reconstructions from the ground up. And this is significant because... Obviously, that must mean that the inscriptions are not original from that time. From the Umaid Codex of Sana, we have designs of a tower that appears to be accessible 
through an elevated platform with stairs as you can see in the image on the left if you look down at the bottom you'll see two sets of stairs because of the centrality of the foundation stone on the temple mount one is allowed to speculate whether the dome of the rock was the design subject in its form at the time of the codex it is possibly based on an, on an octagonal shape but more likely from an eight pointed double square below right which i'll show you in a moment since it neither looks like the one in Charles Mann's Bible, that I will show later, nor the one standing today, these drawings would only help in supporting the case that the Dome of the Rock went through multiple reconstructions from the ground up. Okay, so whenever the Sana manuscript was made, um, the image, the drawing uh, in the Sana manuscript would suggest that this was what was there at that time however it didn't seem to last too long um, because when we look at the Charman Bible from the latter half of the 8th century there's something else there a different um, different size uh, tower uh, with um, a dome on the top of it okay so it's obviously been reconstructed even 100 years later so this is what's depicted in Charman's Bible as you can see this is a very different construction to this one. Okay. Now he goes on to say that this is this uh, uh, building here that's mentioned here on the left. Um, it's part of two images in the Sana manuscript. This is the other image, and uh, this suggests an eight-pointed double square as the foundation of this tower. Okay. Now the this uh, eight-pointed double square is presumably, let me just go back, the section that is uh, from this point downwards, I should say. Okay, this wider part of the base. Okay. Now, this, so this is a mock-up of it in situ. Um, would have been an impressive building. And if uh, there were lights uh, lit inside, you can imagine that it would have been quite a sight to behold from all around Jerusalem. Okay, now the other thing is that the drum appears to be 50 feet in diameter. He says, while this is no base for a conclusion, there's something to be said about the aesthetics of the Sana's drawing. There is no Arab architectural vacuum when I look at the primary evidence of these drawings as part of this oldest Quran. No comparable is extent anywhere. The sectional view reveals a pleasing aspect ratio and a lofty build with countless columned Roman arches that form multi-storied arcades with lamp or coat of arms hanging in each opening. These details are testament for the drawing being a representation of a religiously significant monument already standing rather than one to be constructed. With eight stories, the building is at least 100 feet tall and the drum's diameter over 50 feet. Without knowing the scale of the drawing, the wider base adds only about another 15 feet or the respective ratio thereof and seems to be around 35 feet in height. In other words, about a third of the height up of the tower. Now, the other thing I wanted to say about that is the fact that it's eight stories high. The number eight, as we'll see later, is very significant. It has um, a messianic significance. It also is symbolic of Roman royalty. So it would suggest um, a Jewish link, um, a kind of a Jewish purpose behind it, um, with the elite being behind this uh, building. Okay, so this is uh, a closer image of it. It's 100 feet tall, 50 feet wide, with a uh, height to width ratio of 2 to 1, as you can see there. Okay. Um, again, this idea of the messianic eight-pointed star is referred to here. Um, but notice that it's that and not a star of David that's been referenced. The double square ground plan is somewhat of a surprise other than the identical decorative motif, the sectional drawing does not reveal whether and how they might be related, 
with what appears to be a foundational symbolism that replaced the double triangle of the Star of David with a Muslim double square, an eight-pointed star. That it was an intentional mutilation can be demonstrated with Jerusalem coins that were issued with an eight-pointed star rather than the customary Star of David below right. I have already shown that the Maccabee coins used the messianic eight-pointed star as a symbol of Jewish royalty. So this is no accident. This double square shape that's found in the Sanna manuscript points to Jewish influence. It points to um, a messianic interest. It also points to Jewish royalty. All of these things are very important. He goes on to say this elementary geometric design of the double square is not new though. It can be seen in the 6th century floor mosaic of the Church of the Virgin in Jordan's city with the Madaba map, which you can see the image there on the right. The ideas of the two structures on the parchment and on the Temple Mount are diametrically opposed and likely removed in time, unless as rudimentary geometry teaches one word to connect the eight corners of the double square, voila l'octagon. But it would not be a stretch to speculate that the diameter of the inner drum of the Sanna's drawing would have to rely on the foundation stone's dimensions and would therefore be near the width of the modern drum if it were to depict a structure on the Temple Mount covering the rock. This would render the old drawing's version significantly higher than its modern shape. So the particular width of the drum depicted in this image would kind of tend to lend credence to the idea that this was meant to be over the sacra, you know, where the Dome of the Rock was later um, because of the particular dimensions of it. All right. Now, if we compare the ratios there, the, the one on the left, it's two to one ratio. So twice as high as it is wide. If we compare that with the modern Dome of the Rock, we can see that the Dome of the Rock is actually quite short it's quite stubby uh, ratio of 0.7 to 1 okay so it's not particularly an attractive ratio there in the current dome of the rock and the argument made is that it's much more it's a much more pleasing building uh, that was there originally okay he says the modern building on the temple mount defies the pleasing architecture the dome of the rock appears heavy with a drum and cupola that sit too low Despite its fatty appearance, it looks fragile rather than filigree. The exterior octagonal walls and the weight of the structure appear to want to collapse away from the foundation stone that the building covers. The height of the exterior octagonal walls is completely out of proportion. The modern Dome of the Rock is, in effect, a regression. He says that if Sana is state-of-the-art, then the extent Dome of the Rock is a comparable dark age disgrace. The latter does not fit the description of a building that surpassed all previous buildings. The former does. They are hardly of the same time, let alone of the same spirit. The modern building is completely removed from the cunning courage of the Sana architect, page 43. Um, so I'm giving you the page number so you can have a look at the paper yourself, uh, which is available, and I will leave the link to the paper down below the video. Um, so, he now refers to the Zukkan Chronicle. The key point here is that Al-Mansur, who reigned as Caliph from 754 to 775 AD, turned the temple into a mosque. He says, the lineup of primary evidence continues with the Zukkan Chronicle of the late eighth century. It makes no mention of the Dome of the Rock, when referring to restoration going on in the ruins of Jerusalem. Instead, the Chronicle seems to try to say that whatever may have been on the Temple Mount had not been used as a mosque until Al-Mansur. The Caliph moved into the western region in order to go to Jerusalem. He wreaked havoc, turned everything topsy-turvy, terrorizing and devastating, to a degree worse than in Mesopotamia. He acted as Daniel had prophesied, of the Antichrist himself. He turned the temple into a mosque because the little that remained of Solomon's temple became a mosque for the Arabs. 
he repaired the ruins of Jerusalem. Okay, now, this one building was first a synagogue and was in the northern part of the Temple Mount. That's the key idea. Is it certain that the Temple of Solomon is referring to the dome and not another building on the mount? To fixate the dome or the inscriptions onto Al-Malik, this primary evidence would have to be ignored. From the understanding that something else, a temple, had been converted into a mosque, follows there were not possibly Muslim inscriptions before said conversion. So these inscriptions were not on this building. Moreover, the chronicle appears to mention just a single building, not two. Just a little aside, so that means that the tower that we saw earlier must no longer have existed when he was referring to that single building on the Temple Mount. Besides, I will below show that this one building was probably situated in the north of the Temple Mount. Logic of the primary evidence commands that the Sufyanid monument to the east of the Temple Mount had been raised, while the Temple of Solomon may be the Marwanid synagogue. So, the key thing he's saying is, if it is at a different location, if only one building is mentioned, and if it was converted to a mosque long after the time of Abdul al-Malik's time, then we can't link the extant inscription with Abdul al-Malik. Okay, if that's the only building that existed at that time, it's in the wrong location, um, and it's converted just at that time to to be um, a mosque. That rules out the possibility of there being inscriptions. Okay, if we if we trust this evidence. Now um, he goes on. This is looking at a, a later part of the eighth century. If we accept this is the interior drum, referring to the picture there, then that means we need to throw the interior octagonal arcade under the bus, i.e. it doesn't yet exist. From the late 8th century exists a Bible from the court school of Charman that is now stored in the British Library Rite. It depicts a scene from the Annunciation of the birth of John the Baptist to Zechariah at the altar of the Temple of Jerusalem. Although only a round dome is depicted, it is believed that the intent of the designer was to show the Dome of the Rock. A similar design is found on another manuscript fragment of the court school. So we can probably agree with him that this is likely to be a contemporary image um, and the artist would have imagined that what's there now is what existed at the time of uh, John the Baptist and so on. However, the logic of both drawings points at the intention to show the holy place of Zechariah in the Haram area of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. With a lot of goodwill, it could be viewed as the inner drum of the Dome of the Rock, which may have been standing at the time of the creation of the Bible. We're talking about the 8th century Bible here, not the original Bible. However, that would eliminate inscriptions and mosaics that are mounted on the interior octagonal arcade. In the Dome of the Rock, there, there is obviously uh, the dome at the top, there's the drum in the central part, and then around that central part there is an arcade. But if the arcade didn't exist in the, the late part of the 8th century, then those inscriptions don't come from that period or before come from a later time so I think he's been very logical there just based on the primary evidence of this picture okay so a summary of what we've seen here in, in the paper so far Juice argues that the original building of Umar that was enlarged in the 670s i.e. the Sufyanid structure was located in the eastern part of the Temple Mount i.e. not where the Dome of the Rock is located today it was not built over the foundation stone and I think he makes his case well for that. Second point, while Anastasius Seneta mentions large-scale construction work done by Abdel al-Malik in the 690s, nothing is mentioned about a Dome of the Rock. So we can't assume that he meant to refer to the Dome of the Rock, he just simply doesn't say it, so we can't rest uh, the Dome of the Rock's existence on 
a general statement about construction work. We can speculate maybe that it might have been that, but there's nothing solid yet in in relation to that. Number three, the Sana manuscript hints at a tower on the Temple Mount at the time of the Sana Codex production. He views this solely as evidence that the Dome of the Rock went through numerous reconstructions from the foundations up. And if we go back to number two for a second, okay, in terms of the large scale construction work done by Abdel Malik, it's probably this tower that is being referred to and not the Dome of the Rock. Okay, number four, the Zukkan Chronicle. Al Mansur turned the temple into a mosque. Um, this is 754 to 775, sometime in that period. Juice suggests the Temple of Solomon that was turned into a mosque was a synagogue in the northern part of the Temple Mount, unconnected to the Dome of the Rock's location. Juice says that no mention of the Dome of the Rock is made and only one building is referred to, suggesting the early Sufyanid building was by then raised. So that building that was in the eastern part of the Temple Mount is gone. The tower that we mentioned earlier, this one, is gone. So there's just this building in the northern part in the the latter half of the 8th century. And then we go to towards the end of the 8th century, we have something else. If we accept that this drawing represents what was located in the latter part of the 8th century on the site of the Dome of the Rock, we must acknowledge that the octagonal arcade is missing and with it the inscriptions on it. So this is a different building to the, the high tower that was there decades before. So they must have started from scratch. It's a very different construction, uh, much lower by the looks of it than the other one. Um, but the other point, most important point really, is there's no arcades around it. As you can see there's no arcades around it. So any inscriptions that we find today in this arcade, they do not come from even the latter part of the 8th century. So in other words, 100 years after Abdel al-Malik, still none of these inscriptions there. What was inside here? That's still open to argument. Um, by the looks of it, it looks round here, which is similar to what it is today. But was it continuously round? What was it like later? Um, so that's kind of a point that we'll come back to later. So in conclusion, the primary evidence doesn't support the case for the Dome of the Rock with its arcades in existence by the late 8th century. The evidence suggests that the arcades didn't yet exist, therefore making the arcade inscriptions post-date this period. We could say that the drum appears to be there at the at least in the the latter part of the 8th century. But you remember in the middle of the 8th century, there's no mention of that there. So that would rule out the drum being there at the time of Al Abdel al-Malik. So that means there's really no inscriptions yet. Second point, some evidence suggests that a drum was in existence, but that it was much higher than what currently exists in the Dome of the Rock. But again, middle of the 8th century there's no mention of that so it must have been demolished um, and uh, as I say towards the end of the 8th century something else was built similar to what was there before um, and then third point did inscriptions exist on the inner drum from Abdel al-Malik's time well if we trust the evidence that there was nothing there apart from a building in the northern part in the middle of the 8th century then we'd have to say no um, perhaps it's still not conclusive because the evidence isn't strong enough yet um, but we will look at later periods in its history in search of the first direct attestation of their existence really we can't assert that they existed until we have direct um, witnesses to that from at least some period in the history so we're going to go through the history and see when we first hear of anyone even mentioning these inscriptions and actually quoting them and referencing them and so on okay so that's it this is our part one today we're going to continue with the paper and we're going to explore what the evidence looks like and it will be interesting to see 
how late do we go in its history before we see the first reference to these rock inscriptions inside the drum of the Dome of the Rock. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.